Welcome to Astro Morning Tea at Ikra. I am Greg, and I'm Luke, and we're going to be talking about all sorts of fun science stories, astronomy-based things. Luke, thrill me. You're excitable today. I am. That's good. Yes, yes, I like science it. Science is exciting. Uh, so this week, first of all, we're talking about sausage galaxies. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is the story about a galaxy that collided with the Milky Way about eight to ten billion years ago. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. Yes. Yes. There's a massive crash between these two galaxies. Fantastic. This amazing result from the Gaia team. So Gaia is a space satellite that's measuring how stars are moving in the Milky Way.、Mm -hmm. And what they can do is they can actually reconstruct where those stars came from based on all of their motions. Doing this, they've actually worked out that in the distant past of the Milky Way, there was this big, massive collision with this other galaxy, which they can see in the remnants of the motions of all of these stars. And they've called this the Sausage Galaxy because if you look at the velocities of all of the stars on a, a plot of this, the thing comes out looking like a sausage. Very good point. And it was, so it's obviously smaller than the Milky Way galaxy. It was, yes. It was a dwarf galaxy that smashed into the Milky Way.、Mm. But it was the last sort of major big event that happened to the Milky Way、oh, in terms、okay. of things smashing together. But we're surrounded by dwarf galaxies, aren't we? Like Magellanic clouds, a dwarf. Galaxies near us, and,、yep. and there are other ones around us as well. Yes, there are. This one was a lot bigger than those,、oh, though. So、okay. it's the last big event.、Uh, ultimately, there will be a massive collision between the Andromeda Galaxy and、yeah. the Milky Way Galaxy, <laughs>、uh, filming. Uh, producing eventually something that people have called milk dromeda,、mm. but that's not going to happen to a few billion years in the future. So, so we're okay. We're so wait、good. for that one. So we're the big bully, basically eating up all the little dwarf galaxies. But there's another big bully coming towards us. Yeah, yeah. Going to deal with us. Yeah, yeah. Our time. We're on borrowed time. <laughs> that's right. So, so live life fully. That's what I have to say. You've only got two billion years, people. Get to it. <laughs> next story. <laughs> next story. Great. So next in the news this week, there was an amazing story from Sphere、uh, detecting a planet. Uh, so Sphere is a new instrument that's been released on the ESO telescope, the very large telescope, which is in Chile. I love it.、Uh, <laughs> this instrument is amazing because it actually is able to detect and actually image planets <sighs> going round other stars. So exciting! So it's the first time we've had a direct image that has been confirmed of a planet <sighs> going round another star, which is amazing. And you can also measure the composition of the atmosphere from that planet as well. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. So, th so this thing's incredibly cool because it has it basically has this thing that blocks out the light from the star, which allows you to see the very faint planet going round it, and also、oh, this. Stuff called adaptive optics. Adaptive optics is when you actually, in real time, measure what's going on with the atmosphere around the Earth, and you actually distort your mirror to correct for what's going on in the atmosphere to give you much higher resolution and to see much smaller objects. I love the fact we're at the start of this. Of, we're finding out exoplanets are out there by seeing wobbles of stars and and the the shifting of the light. But now we're getting to the point we can image the planets themselves. Yes.、Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this this so, thing is like、so、a、exciting. big Jupiter. It's bigger than Jupiter, and it's orbiting around its star at about the distance of Uranus around the Sun.、Um, but it's、so It's a massive thing, and you but you can see it、uh, right from the Earth, which is pretty amazing. It is amazing. We we at that. Oh, I just I can't even speak. I'm so excited. It's just, You're overcome、I'm、with just, science. I am. No, I really am. Don't pass out, Greg. We, it's okay. We start with take your science pills. <laughs> we start with exoplanets, and they really you find the really big ones because they're easy to find. But then you get to smaller ones and smaller ones. You start getting to Earth-sized ones with maybe atmospheres in the future. Just、saying. yeah. So this is kind of a new domain、mm. of actually directly imaging them、uh, with these telescopes. And Sphere is an amazing instrument. I'm very excited. All right, before I get too excited, we have to now go. To our question. The question is from Kyle, and the question is: How do scientists use radio telescopes? The universe is an extremely dynamic place, where there are explosions going off everywhere, every second. Of course, everybody knows that massive stars explode, and these are called supernova. And supernova are so optically bright that they outshine all the other stars in their host galaxy. But what I'm interested in is the invisible light from these explosions. The radio light, and this can only be observed with radio telescopes. The catch is that this radio light fades very quickly, within a few days, even minutes or seconds following the explosion. I use robotic radio telescopes. These robotic telescopes receive the position of an explosion from satellites in space and automatically repoint and begin observing the explosion as soon as it occurs. This way, we get the very earliest information about the radio light being produced by these explosions. Thank you, Dr. Gemma Anderson, for answering that question about how scientists use radio telescopes. I need a fact. So, I need facts. Random fact of the week this week, Greg. I think this one you might be able to answer. Oh, okay.、Good. So, my question this week is, Greg,、mm. why was Mother's Day invented? Because They get really annoyed when you forget, and they punish you harshly. Even, so they knew that you even, forgot even before it was、uh, invented. Mothers are amazing; they know things. Even now, like my mother will hunt me down if I forget it. So it's just like don't do it. It's strange because I expected you to answer that greeting cards companies invented it to make money because that's、oh. the that's what I was always told <laughs> as a, a child. I just fear my mother. No, 
<laughs> uh, so that was what I was told as a child. But in fact, that isn't the case. Uh, Mother's Day was actually uh, instigated as an idea by someone called Anna Jarvis oh. uh, in uh, the early 20th century in Philadelphia. Uh, the first Mother's Day was actually set up as a rather somber affair where she basically gave a speech about her own mother and her mother's life. Uh, she asked people to wear white flowers and uh, to go, and they all went and listened to the speech, and that was the first Mother's Day. Oh, lovely. She then campaigned for the next six years to get Mother's Day recognized as a national holiday in America, which she eventually did. A, a national, national holiday? Yeah, so oh, it became a national mm -hmm. holiday uh, in the early 20th century. And then almost instantly, the uh, commercialization of Mother's Day started. So people started making, selling flowers for Mother's Day, making chocolates, making cards, <laughs> and going out straight away. She absolutely hated this mm. completely, and she basically said it was super lazy to just buy a card for your mother when you could write her a letter or something like that. Yes, yes. So she then spent the rest of her life trying to get rid of Mother's Day after <laughs> instigating it herself. So she's basically spent her entire fortune trying to get rid of Mother's Day. Uh, she actually ended up living a quite solitary life only oh. life after she spent all of her money just, and she never actually succeeded oh. in getting rid of Mother's Day. And there's, But there's a small twist in this Ooh. in that when she was eventually uh, very old and had to go into care when she was older, she couldn't actually afford to go into care. Mm. And actually a group of local businessmen who had benefited extremely from Mother's Day from selling things actually paid for her hospital oh. care without telling her so that she could be looked after. That's lovely. The, the wonder of business. <laughs> yes. Great? And I was thinking after Mother's Day was instigated, there was, just, there was just that one guy who was like, but what about Father's Day? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> That's anyway. a joke. That's a joke. They uh, definitely do matter. They definitely, well, they do. I'm just, it, this is a whole different thing. Thank you for listening to Astro Morning Tea. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> Thank you, Angry Greg. <laughs> and uh, welcome, welcome. Goodbye. I don't know what side. If you're watching it backwards, it's hello. And uh, we'll see you next time. Polished. <laughs>